Victor Naj, Victor joined GitLab, an all remote company in the DevSecOps space in 2019, right before the outbreak of the pandemic. He is a seasoned product person who managed to adapt various product techniques to the remote nature of the 21st century. And he's very kind to join us today to share his knowledge with us. Victor, please come to the stage. Can I have a round of applause to Victor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. First of all, thank you for pronouncing my name properly. It really happens with my family name. So I would like to speak about remote product management and actually the message that I want to transfer to you that, yes, you can make it work. Now, I didn't believe in it when I joined GitLab, actually. I know Marty Kagan, not just by reading, but personally. I know his stand on it, that remote product management is an anti-pattern. And I was quite dubious about it, but the company seemed to be awesome. I was hired. I gave it a try. After three months in, I wanted to quit. That's the end of the probation period in Hungary, three months. But back then, my manager, an amazing person, Kenneth Johnston, convinced me that I'm doing right, and he knows that adopting to remote takes time. So I stayed, and around the fourth month, for the first time, I had that really amazing feeling that I'm, I was used to in an office setting when I know that I'm doing product, I'm building value, I know what's happening, what's coming out, out of my hands. It was awesome. Since then, this is still 2019, a lot of things changed, and I'm quite comf comfortable now with remote product management. And I could do this talk action two levels. One would be the personal practices, what I did, how I opted, etc. This talk is not about that. This talk is about more how the organization can support remote product management. And actually, I'm a product person, and I don't know your problems. I don't know your issues with remote. So. If you want to ask questions, please, once again, scan this QR code. This is the Slido side, side for questions and answers. And I would, be, I would love to see your questions to speak about that. But I have something to say to set the context and a couple of ideas on that. So at GitLab, we had a handbook. In the very end, I will share you another QR code with links. Um, in that handbook, there is a whole subsection about remote work. And there, we define remote work at 10 levels that we typically simplify to five, to these five levels. First, somewhere there's a laser pointer, never mind. There is the 100% office-based setup where remote is not allowed at all. I've heard at such places, I guess some of you did as well. The second is what I know is the most common before the pandemic when I last worked for a non- or remote company, where Working remote is an exception. For example, even this day, my wife works from home on Tuesdays and Fridays, but every time she has to ask for an exception. Back at a different company, um, we had one amazing engineer whom we didn't want to lose, and he was allowed to work from home on every Friday. But that was the exception. Then we have the um, hybrid setup, where you have both an office and not. Personally, I think this is the hardest to do right. The fourth option is what we call remote first. In that case, you still have offices, but even in the office, you are expected to work remotely. Yeah, two days ago, I had a very, very quick chat with Ishtwan here, and he told me that like, when he goes to the office, you actually don't know the person who are there because all your team is actually remote. That's most likely this remote first setup. And finally, you have the all remote setup here. That's what GitLab does, where Actually, GitLab doesn't have an office at all. Um, we have company get-togethers and stuff like that, but that's, there's no office. The closest that you can get to the headquarters is likely the CEO's flat in San Francisco. And I would like to speak about four principles uh, that I think are very important to do remote product management right. The first one is to fully support your remote workforce. This means that especially when you are in a hybrid setup, or even in a remote first setup, that's the tricky part. Because what I know about us product people is that we are very, very success-driven, we are motivated, often we are very competitive as well. 
And if you don't have an equal playing field for the remote workers who might be hundreds or thousands of kilometers away from your office, and the others who are sometimes meet the chief product officer, sometimes meet the CEO head to head and have a coffee, then you will likely lose those product managers. Because if it just backfire, they can't be as successful because of that uh, disconnection. So building out full support is really important. And this happens in many ways, actually, in GitLab as well, because a lot of the leadership is in the US. So time zone-wise, it's much easier for a product manager to catch a product leader after a call than it is, for example, for me, who is in Hungary. And to fight that, at GitLab, what we have is that US leadership is, favors the morning hours to be scheduled by Europeans. So if I, am, I want to schedule a call and the time slot is already taken by a US colleague, they will just cancel that call to take mine instead. This is to really support uh, the remote workforce that you can do. But I would like to go into more details around this, because like, trust, we know, it's super important, inclusive is important. I think mostly I spoke about this aspect up to this point. And another thing that you could do to build inclusivity is actually to have an extremely written culture. I already mentioned the GitLab handbook before. I will share a link about it at the very end. Everything in that handbook is how GitLab works. Before GitLab became a public company, the handbook was really, all the processes, all the information about GitLab was there publicly available. And all that helps because then all the employees of GitLab know how a given process works, where they can reach someone. And even if you are sit in the same office than someone else, they will just point you to the handbook that go there and read that page. And finally, today we have amazing tools to support remote work, like Zoom, Loom, you name it, basically, uh, whichever you prefer. But I think this is the most important, and actually this is the only one where you need support at the company level. The other three principles that I'm going to share can be started at the product division level, or even perhaps at lower levels, but that might be a bit tricky. So, the second principle is strong alignment, loosely coupled. This quote comes from a colleague of mine, uh, Fabian Zimmer, a director of product at GitLab. And this is the basic setup of a remote product team. If you, you will be loosely coupled by design, actually. So you can't avoid that. And in order to make it work, you need that strong alignment. Often, what I see is that there are great tools for alignment, like vision setting, strategy, OKRs, all of this. But here, you will actually have really extreme empowerment at the, at the leaf of your organization. And that's what you have to design your alignment operations for. And how this will work out in your case likely depends on your history. At GitLab, we are very good in being loosely coupled because GitLab has an open source engineering culture. For years, basically, there was just open contribution to GitLab even from within the company. There was no product uh, as such. Later on, the product organization born and, and product uh, managers and directors and VPs arrived to the company. But basically, the first thing, and we are still fighting that a little bit, is that it's just too loosely coupled. Engineers sometimes just take on tasks on their own without the PM knowing about it, for example. So here, it's extremely important for us to have alignment, not only coming from the company, but really even working on it at the team level, that you have to make sure that all the teams have a direction that's motivating for them, so they don't want to start working on other things. And this was principle number two. Principle number three is that you have to have a single source of truth, which means that, like our handbook, all the company processes are described there. Again, I will give an example of my wife, who works at a university in Hungary, where, when she arrived many years ago, there was just a chaos. Like, she tried to get a signature, an approval from someone, and nobody knew where she has to go to get that. 
And I started to tell her, just, just start to document what you learned. Do it anywhere. Let it be a Google Doc or a wiki that the IT sets up for you. It doesn't matter. Just have it documented somewhere and keep that single place to document more and more learnings that you have. And then when you hire people, always point them to the documentation and ask them to update that documentation. And this way, basically, you can start building out a handbook very easily. And after that, as people know that, like, oh, I always go to that place to learn about product processes, I would just start a subsection for product marketing or for sales or for engineering. And this way it can grow actually quite organically, even from a product uh, start. So one of, actually, GitLab, I would say, have now three single sources of truth. One is our handbook. The other, since we became a public company, is our internal handbook. It's super confusing to have two handbooks. And the third thing is our issue tracker. And these are all the places where anything that's long-lived lives. And they, it's very easy to figure out what you should learn in the, look for the issue tracker and what you should look for in the handbook. And this will help a lot in the end to really build the scale to support remote work again, as I shared in principle one and even with the alignment a little bit. Then principle four is where we're getting more to the uh, daily operations. You should really find a balance between async and sync work, which means that even though GitLab is all remote, there's actually quite a lot of sync, in, in, sync interaction between people, let alone there are actually pair programming happening between engineers, but at the same time, we run design sprints, which is Less sync than you do in an office setting, but it's still quite out of sync uh, interaction during the design sprint. We have regular meetings, and definitely one of the most important things here are the company get-togethers. In the past years, we couldn't have them as we did before COVID because of the pandemic. But we already know when we will have the next one uh, early next year. And actually, last year, we already had smaller department-level get-togetherings, and we are going to have one in two weeks uh, in Berlin, actually, for the product department. So the, the sync time is super important to build relationships and to do work as well. But at the same time, you have to do async as well. And here, I would like to come up with like four, if I remember all of them, uh, levels of product work. Uh, and how it works. Like, in problem validation, what you have to do is that you have to adopt all your processes to remote work. Like, design sprint works very differently in a at GitLab than in an office setting. But once you make that adoption, I would say that it drafted the same amount of energy, the same results. It, it's really successful how you can run these processes. Once you have your problems, solidified and you know what you want to solve and you go into uh, solutionizing, there I would say that a remote setup actually has a slight advantage over an on-site setup because to come up with the solutions, that's a really creative process where it's good to have time to think, it's good to have really different work uh, views to discuss, and for that it helps if you can be remote across the globe and get really different perspectives simply because of the, of the cultural background. Personally, I'm in the process as a, as a quite, of a quite big uh, solution design initiative, and it's going on now for more than a month. And it's just amazing to see the diversity that I have never experienced actually before, like years ago in an office setting when we're trying to design a solution. And once you are done with that, and you get to the more to delivery phase with refinement, I think that's the hardest part of working all remote, to really make sure that you manage to communicate the smallest bits the same way how you intend to have. And at the vision level, product problem space, solution, it works very well, this communication, because everybody, given the time frame and everything, will have the same understanding. But once you want to get to the small details, you want to have to spend a bit less time there, and that's the hardest. So that's where I pay quite a lot of focus, and I, when I'm managing others, I try to check on, on them how refining goes and whether the engineers really understand the same thing that the product wants them to work on. 
And finally, once we get to delivery, that's where even Marty Kagan says that likely a remote setup is more efficient than an office setup. So there, there are not many questions. I'm way faster than I should be. I'm just checked out the uh, clock, but I will try to make that up somehow. Finally, I came with a bonus idea as well that is not specific to being remote, but I think it's super simple and super valuable as well, especially if you are in a B2B setup, in an enterprise B2B setup like GitLab. There, what I learned, I, by accident, almost always worked in enterprise B2B companies, is that our customers want to build a relationship with us. They want partners. They don't want a supplier. They want to really have a close relationship. And simply, if you allow them to your issue tracker, that builds trust. Moreover, if you allow them to your issue tracker, you will have a requirement to keep it tidy, to keep it high quality. And that helps with having a single source of truth where everybody will go for that information. That helps with running the remote team that you actually have. And in the end, it helps as well a lot with discovery and solution validation because people will actually add their thoughts to the issue tracker. They will signal that something is important to them. And if you have questions, you know whom to reach out to. A typical thing I do is that I just ping a bunch of people who have voted an issue and ask them that, like, please add more details because I need more context to understand the whole topic. And then I typically get into a discussion with a few people. After that, I invite them to a call. Or if they are a Hungarian company, sometimes I even go out and visit them locally. So this you can do no matter um, whether you are a full remote company or not. And I'm way ahead of time. But my message is that the remote PM work can be efficient, but we have to learn and design for it, actually. The interesting thing is that we did not notice, but we designed for the on-site work as well. We just get to there from the university, from another company, that was we got used to. That, that, those are the practices that we learned. And here we have to relearn the same practices in a remote setting. So to summarize the principles, one, and likely the most important one, is to provide full support for your remote workforce. Make an equal playing field for everyone, no matter whether they are remote or sitting beside you, no matter whether they can catch you after a call, actually. Once someone gave, came up with the idea that they were in a hybrid setting, and I don't remember what was the person's role, but he was at a higher level in the product organization, and some PMs always went to him after the call ended to discuss further the topic that was uh, discussed during the meeting itself, and he decided to take those meetings in a coffee instead, in order to not make it possible for others to approach him why the half of the team is actually closed out of this discussion, because the other half is remote. The second principle was to have a strong alignment and accept that you will have super loose coupling. Third was the single source of truth, start a handbook and make a very strong culture in writing, balance synchronous and asynchronous work in discovery, and finally, if you can, try to open up your issue tracker. I think the simplest to start with is actually to start writing a handbook. And uh, with that note, I would like to share a link to the GitLab handbook. Um, it's actually, I think, a link to the remote handbook specifically. But feel free to use it, learn from it. And um, we have a bit more than 10 minutes for questions. Not in front of the speakers. I learned my lesson. <laughs> Thank you so much, Victor. Please. And don't worry about being ahead of time. At least we have time for questions. Because after this talk, we are going to have a hard stop at uh, 4.24. Because we have the streaming for the gifts and etc. So it's actually good that you stopped ahead of time. Can we have the questions on the screen? Okay, our first question is, if you were so skeptic if remote product management would work, what motivated you to sign up for the job regardless of the first place, in the first place? Yeah, it was primary curiosity and an appreciation for the product itself. 
I knew GitLab from its very early days. Then I lost track of it. And uh, when I, I was looking for a job in 2019, and I saw the job posting, and I was like, oh, I knew, I knew this product. Let's, let's check out what they have. And once I checked out the company page itself, it's the culture page, I was like, it can't be true. If you check out the GitLab culture page, even today, it's just awesome. And my idea was like, that if 1% of what's written down in that culture page works in life as it's written down, this should be the most amazing company in the world. And Back at the days, it was more like 90% that worked according to the culture page. It was just really an awesome experience. But yes, I was really skeptical about my own work. So, Thank you. Next, how can you really connect with the team if you never met them? First of all, we do meet. This is very important. And I think that's one of the reasons why even being remote first or hybrid might not work because then you, the company has to pay an office and likely would need to pay as well to get the team together at least from time to time. So we do meet. Uh, we met in various ways, uh, either going to conferences and organizing ourselves to meet there, either simply the company has in, having dedicated budgets to get together at the team level or to get together at the company level, which didn't happen for years. But the other thing as well is that we are actually working. We, it's very important to have something like coffee chats. That is, you do it in office without making it a, a thing because you just go out for coffee. Here at GitLab, it's a, it's a dedicated uh, event that you are encouraged to have coffee chats with others. And the idea is the same. You are just chatting about anything you want to do. You can we are sometimes play games online, um, have social channels, and a very interesting thing is that <clears throat> what I noticed, and I heard this back as feedback from others as well, we are a truly global team. And sharing about your culture and being open when others share about their culture, that brings inclusivity and trust at amazing speed. And simply when, for example, one of my Japanese colleagues uh, sent in a message to our social channel saying that I will be out for a week because this is the holiday week in Japan and then sh he shared a couple of week Wikipedia links there and simply we were really interested in what he shared and after that he told to me in one of our calls that that was the best experience he ever had that the team was so welcoming about him sharing about his culture so that's how you make connections in a remote setting so the elements of connection are still there, just invest in different ways. Exactly. And it's very important to invest in them. Very good. Um, how do you solve the time zone issues? Now we have the example of the Japanese colleague. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, actually, with the Japanese uh, culture, it's relatively easy because they're extremely hardworking. And even though likely they work the most in the team, they always say that they have to work harder because others work more than they do. But um, there are, as I said, uh, very strict um, guidelines, for example, from our CEO who is in West Coast and he says that morning hours from I don't know what to 12 are dedicated to European colleagues. And then later hours are dedicated to Asian colleagues. So you actually try to favor people in other time zones primarily. Um, one could ask as well, but how do you make a team call across time zones, uh, you don't. It's not expected at all to work outside of work hours at GitLab. We actually have two team calls. One is at 9 in the morning for me. The other is at half past 5, I think. And this way, every second week, I have a team call with the whole team. Thank you. What are the differences between Hungarian online co-workers and another one in another continent? Wow, well, everything. <laughs> um, I, don't know you, I don't know how much you know about Hungarian culture. It's a quite traditional one in a Central European way. My Japanese colleague, I learned from him that that's a very traditional culture in an Asian way. Now we have a, a colleague in Australia from the Philippines who was very open that like 
her background, she doesn't really follow much uh, traditional Filipino culture at all. And it's very different. Uh, every, like, I, I can't name similarities, actually. Um, I can tell you plenty of stories uh, in cross-cultural relationships, but um, I will leave it after the talk. Nice, thank you. Um, what's not intuitive to design for? Any nuances that need a process in remote setup, which, which don't otherwise? Time zones. Um, so I said that we adopted design sprints to a remote setup. Actually, that was led by me, and now we are at iteration four, and we, are, we just started to teach it to other teams within GitLab um, with a UX counterpart how to design sprints here. I think it was the second iteration or the third that was a real failure, where the person who was in charge of the design sprint did not realize how time zones fit and when the day starts and when it ends. So while the decision maker wanted to be there on the first call and the last call, which was very meaningful every day, because of time zones, it was mixed up, and actually they were present in two calls at the middle of the day. So that designing the whole process around time zones and around the globe, that's very tricky. But here I would like to make a, a note, though, that I'm speaking from GitLab's perspective. You might be fully remote working in a single time zone, or being mostly European, or any other continent. So it doesn't have to be global. Uh, and then most of these time zone issues are solved automatically. Thank you. How do you substitute the chats at the coffee machine? I mean, the unofficial information flow. With coffee chats, as I mentioned before. Um, we organize them quite regularly. There was a time when I sa said that I want to have five chats per week. Uh, quite a lot of them random people, so not only within the team, but really just anyone. There's a bot on Slack where you can sign up, and then you will be matched now, I think, every second week or third week uh, by a new person. I'm looking at one of my colleagues here. Once per month now, yeah. It's, I'm still on that bot after four years, because it's just fun to meet people. Typically, the more the new joiners are there. Um, but yeah, so we do coffee chats just like in an office setting. Thank you. Um, how, how much did the handbook change since you joined GitLab? Does it change often? Yes, it's truly a living document. So I never thought that such things exist than living documents, but it does. Um, you, I think one thing that GitLab figured out very well is the onboarding. It's tedious because you onboard on your own. Typically, when you join a company, you want to be productive on day one. Here, when you join GitLab, you are, you are said that you shouldn't do any work for a week, basically, because you are just onboarding. And one step in the onboarding process back in 2019, and I think even today, is that you have to edit the handbook. You are asked that if anything was unclear in the process, go to the handbook, uh, explain it more so the next joiner will have a better experience. It's, it's really a living handbook. Thank you. Uh, Marie is asking if we can have the final screen with references once again. Uh, my technician people. Hey, guys. Guys? Victor. Can we put the final screen once again? His final presentation screen. In the meanwhile, I will ask you the other questions, okay? Um, how, do you keep, how do you keep a handbook properly structured, consistent, and coherent in a large organization? Can you recommend good practices? Um, that's a tricky one, definitely. So I think today the handbook has a quite good search. Uh, this wasn't the case like a couple of years ago. The other thing is that the handbook is basically organized by the company structure. Um, we are not a matrix organization, but a simple hierarchy, single dimensional one, and basically this way you can find the product handbook. Under the product handbook you will have different topics, and so on and so forth, and then there is a separate subsection for engineering, where all the teams present themselves, and so on. 
So um, there is a relatively simple hierarchical logic to the handbook and a very good search. All right, we have five more questions, so I will ask you to not write more questions at this point, okay? We can have, I, I think, all of them, but then after this, it's better to wait for the, for the streaming, and then also you have like five minutes for freshen up and go around. All right, the next one is, do you meet your Hungarian colleagues in person? How does it influence or affect your relationship with your other colleagues? <laughs> this is a, a very good question. Um, thankfully, I had a Hungarian colleague, a very close colleague, like a, a direct counterpart, up to the 1st of January. <clears throat> he was an Italian guy who moved back to Rome uh, at the beginning of this year. And we met at least once per month. And there was a point when I was thinking that we shouldn't do this because it might badly affect the rest of the team. At the same time, as we didn't have many uh, team gatherings because of COVID, this was like a large lifesaver for both of us. And we started to cut back on the number of meetings once we started to have team meetings, actually. How did it help? Very likely, neither of us would be at GitLab if we wouldn't have those meetings uh, back in 2021 and early 2022. It didn't have any negative repercussions. Um, might be because we were quite careful to, to not necessarily speak uh, work. Both of us are dog lovers, and uh, we know each other's pets very well. And the other thing is that often we actually met with the whole team in Hungary, where most of the people are in totally different domains. So it was just like recruiters, salespeople, and so on, and, and uh, that's how we hanged out. Uh, went for dinner or something. Thank you. Levente asks, how do you keep a handbook? Oh, that, that question already went. Thank you. So Radovan asks, GitLab is a handbook first company. What is, as per your experience, a good approach to put some text or guideline in a readme.md file instead of a handbook? Yeah. Um Okay, that, that is two things. One is when you are describing a process or a tool that's really used by the whole company, then in the README, I would put a link to the handbook. There are other cases where you are describing a very specialized tool specifically for a sub-department or, or even just a few people, then the README can serve that theme and it might not even appear in the handbook or just a link somewhere that we use this tool over there. Thank you. Two last questions. Levente asks, are other good practices to establish and keep up strong alignment other than having a handbook? Definitely. Um, actually, at the alignment section, I was speaking about the vision, the strategy, and the OKRs. So there are much better tools for alignment than the handbook. It's really these, the same techniques that we use for aligning organizations work in an async setting. And these three that I mentioned, these are the ones that we use at GitLab as well. They work very well uh, in a remote setup. But there might be others that I'm not even aware of. And last question from Istvan. Just curious. What are some example, to example topics which cannot be part of the public handbook for a public company? Financial results, for example, even forecasts. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Victor. Please don't forget to rate Victor's performance on Slido. And yes, let's give him a round of applause.